The Selfish Path to Romance. Download Chapter 1 for free at drkenner.com and at amazon.com. Look, Jeff, we had two wonderful months this summer, but that was it. Happens all the time. Wife and kids go away to the country and the boss has a fling with the secretary or the manicurist or the elevator girl. Come September, the picnic's over. Goodbye. The kids go back to school. The boss goes back to the wife. And the girl? They don't make these shrimp like they used to. When I think about when I was first having children, I can remember that my husband used to try to pull me away from the baby. And I would say, it was our daughter at the time, he would try to pull me away and I would say, you're crazy, I need to stay home. And I am so glad, looking back on that experience, that we took vacations with one another. How do you stay connected to your spouse throughout your marital relationship. With me today to discuss this is Dr. Barry McCarthy. He's a professor of psychology at American University and a certified marital and sex therapist. Uh, He's presented many workshops nationally and internationally and he also has co-authored eight books with his wife Emily including Rekindling Desire. What a pleasure to have you on the show today Dr. McCarthy. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, In terms of staying connected, what advice do you give people to stay connected? Well, two pieces of advice. The first is to remember that the most important bond in your family is a husband-wife bond, that you need to nurture that and reinforce that, and in the long run, that's the best investment you make in terms of your family and your children. Um, Having a parents who are a solid marital couple is a very good thing for kids. The second is that I tell couples to stay away from the trap of intercourse or nothing. So many people fall into that pattern where um, the woman says, if I'm not ready to have intercourse, I don't, I'm going to avoid contact with my spouse, that I, I don't have the energy for intercourse. What I say to people is that it's touching is valuable in and of itself. And we use the analogies of five gears of touching or five dimensions of touching. What are those? And that had the first is, uh, think about it as like a stick shift car. The first gear is affectionate gear. And what you mean by that is hands on touching, clothes on touching, things like holding hands, kissing, hugging. Um... And the fifth gear is the intercourse gear. And what happens with too many people is that they either get into intercourse or nothing, or the only gears they have is affection or intercourse. And what I try to say to them is you want to keep contact and make it a pleasure-oriented contact. So the second gear is a sensual gear, and it's a non-genital gear. It can be clothed or unclothed. It's the kind of thing you cuddle on the couch, you cuddle before um, you go to sleep or when you wake in the morning, uh, you do non-genital massage. Uh, It's a very important gear because I think that, again, sensuality is the underpinning of sexual response. And then the third gear is a playful gear, mixing non-genital and genital touching. Uh, It can occur cold, semi-cold, or nude, inside, outside the bedroom. And it's the kind of thing where people... Uh, take showers or baths together, where they dance together, where they play strip poker together. And then the fourth gear, which is actually the most controversial gear for married couples, is genital stimulation to high arousal and orgasm for one or both of you that doesn't involve intercourse. And people are used to that gear from um, premarital sex, but they say, well, now that I'm married, I'm never going to use that gear again. And in fact, for many couples, that can be a very important gear, especially when intercourse is impossible or one person is more into wanting a sexual experience than the other. You know, I can hear some of my clients, if they were to hear this, the the women would say, Hey, I got to interrupt this because we've got to pay some bills. 30 seconds, that's it. A very quick ad and then Alan will be back. Romance. Oh, I wish guys knew more about what we want from a relationship. Boy, I wish I knew more about what I want. Where's that ad I saw? Ah, here it is. The Selfish Path to Romance. A serious romance guidebook. 
Download Chapter 1 for free at SelfishRomance.com and buy it at Amazon.com. Hmm, the selfish path to romance. That is interesting. You know, I can hear some of my clients, if they were to hear this, the, the women would say, you know, you're crazy because you're mentioning all these gears, but my husband only has one gear. It's gear number five. And if I just go to brush his hair, he expects that it's going to lead to intercourse, so I can't even touch him anymore. If I were to take a bath with him, if we didn't have intercourse, I'd, there'd be hell to pay. Mm-hmm. I think that is the kind of battle that men and women get into, and it's a bad battle for both the man, the woman, and the couple relationship. That when they think of themselves as intimate sexual friends, that each of them has a right to make a request. Each of them has a right to say, no, I'm not into this right now. So what we do is that we'll have them have a date, whether it's once a month, once every other month, that's a sensual date. Or they have a date that can be a sexual date, but there's a prohibition on intercourse. Now, how would you set up that date? Like, say you were advising that to me and my husband, not that I'm looking for personal therapy (laughs) here. Uh, How would you advise a couple to set up a monthly date? Well, the way I would advise them is when they have the time and privacy and they're awake and alert and alive. And often that means when the kids are asleep or the kids are out in the house. And where they're going to to have a date where they're going to play, where they're going to use touch as a way of being connected and playful. Okay. So it would be more in the sense of saying, Ellen, maybe make a date with Harris, you know, plan to go, Harris is my husband, for those mm-hmm. listening, um, have a ha, plan to go out to a hotel room, or what we typically do, we do do this, we'll go to a bed and breakfast, periodically mm-hmm. we just take off to some charming, relatively local, because I don't like to spend a lot of my hours driving, mm-hmm. uh, place, and we'll go to a charming, bed, a charming bed and breakfast, and it feels like we've been away for a month, and we've only been away overnight. That's right. I think one of the best investments that couples make with each other is whether it's just once a year or it's a week away or it's two weekends away where they go away without the kids. That um, rather than it being selfish, which I think is what everybody worries about, it's, again, a good emotional investment for yourself. It's a good emotional investment for your marriage. But in the long run, it's also a really good emotional investment for your children. Um, we are now grandparents, and one of the things that we're really looking forward to is in May we're going to go to uh, Germany where my son and daughter-in-law are living, and we're going to watch their two-year-old um, daughter, our granddaughter, for two, uh, 11 days while they take a trip. And I think they're looking forward to it, we're looking forward to it, and our granddaughter's looking forward to it. And so that's, Everybody wins. So that's one of the gears of connection, too, that even though they're not taking the vacation until, would you say, May, mm-hmm. they still live it. They can fantasize about it. They can imagine it, and that forms a nice bond for them, just that anticipatory excitement. Absolutely true. That uh, a lot of what goes into sexual desire is a positive anticipation. You're looking forward to sharing pleasure, which is totally the opposite of what you uh, were talking about, of the person who says, I couldn't suggest this because we're going to get into a fight about it. Right. It's the opposite of getting into a fight right. about it. It really is both of you anticipating. So it's both of you being self-valuing, which I would call selfish in a very healthy sense. Absolutely. And it's not a me-only view where the guy only gets the satisfaction, which you'll never get that way, because if the woman's performing dutifully, it's a, a false victory that he's won. So, um, listen, I want to thank you so much for your advice. This is Dr. Barry McCarthy, and he's a sex, marital and sex therapist, and he's written and co-authored over eight books with his wife, Emily. And Dr. McCarthy, where could somebody get your books, and what books would you recommend? Well, the two books that I would recommend that Emily and I have written is Rekindling Desire, uh, which talks about how to get out of the slump of a non-sexual relationship or fighting about sexual frequency. And the second book that we recommend is a book that is a prevention book. It's called Getting It Right the First Time, Creating Healthy Marriage, which talks about the first two years of marriage. Well, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. For more Dr. Kenner podcasts, go to drkenner.com and please listen to this ad. 
Here's an excerpt from The Selfish Path to Romance by clinical psychologist Dr. Ellen Kenner. Another skill necessary for effective communication between romantic partners is speaking assertively. Let's say that Paul and Sarah are discussing an upcoming holiday, and Sarah assumes they will spend it with her dysfunctional family. Paul, however, prefers a private getaway for the two of them in the Bahamas, or even going to a restaurant by themselves for a cozy holiday dinner. One wrong approach Paul might use is to talk aggressively. He might say, Why the heck do we have to spend the day with those jerks? You always feel you need to please your family. I'm not wasting my time with your crazy family. I don't care what you do. This aggressive approach is referred to as finger-pointing language or you language, since the essence of it is an attack on the character of the listener. You can download Chapter 1 for free at drkenner.com, and you can buy the book at amazon.com. The Dr. Ellen Kenner Podcast. Now, for many students heading off to college, it's their first time getting a taste of living apart from their parents. You might remember your own experiences of leaving home for the first time, what that was like for you. What happens when a parent doesn't let go? Dr. Lewis. The Dr. Ellen Kenner Podcast is 10 minutes of advice to callers on romance, parenting, family, and friendship conflicts. At drkenner.com, you can choose podcasts on dozens of topics and hear Dr. Kenner solve her caller's personal difficulties. There's uh, an old Greek story about this that says that if a child is kept under uh, lock and key by his parents where every move is controlled, as soon as he gets his first chance at being independent, he will go off and go crazy, basically. He partying, rebels. Partying all night, he rebels. Visit drkenner.com and go to the radio podcast section. That's drkenner.com. D-R-K-E-N-N-E-R dot com.